So we are ridiculously honored and privileged yes. to be here. Um, Tim, we, uh, we follow pretty much all of your everything you guys produce. Um, we've actually, Ryan actually has a, a drawing of the Jesus in the background. <laughs> on my snowboard. Um, on oh, snowboard wow. To you know, I thought, <laughs> no, Jim, I wondered. <laughs> It looks yeah. familiar. Yeah, but. yeah, we uh, we're kind of, we're kind of That's awesome. uh, we're Bible Project nerd. We're fans. We're <laughs> All right. Gosh, cool. Man. Um, but seriously, you guys at the Bible Project are cr crushing it. Ryan's a, he's a he's sort of a halls of academia type of person, and I'm not. I'm a less of a that. <laughs> You're a normal, a normal, right. well-adjusted person, probably. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> unlike the unlike the other two of you sitting here. Um, but we we love the way you guys make the Bible understandable. You you take these complicated things and make them slightly less complicated for the, the rest of us lay folk. And we love what you guys do. So so we're actually really, really privileged to be able to to chat to you like this. This is pretty amazing. Awesome. Oh, that's great. That's great, man. I'm I'm totally happy to talk. Uh I was really uh excited when you guys reached out because uh, normally when we have interviews it's with people that it's just really different different culture whatever the christian culture is really diverse and uh but any time i can talk with somebody who's been a part of skateboard snowboard culture i always feel a little more comfortable <laughs> one of us <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. i mean obviously these cultures this snow skate surf culture that we're in is um, it's a very visual culture too. Like they're super mm -hmm. into design and all that stuff. And you guys have done, you guys have gone above and beyond. So mm -hmm. we, we really respect what you do. And it's so, it's a well-known fact that you have a background in this, um, this skate snow surf culture. And so we thought it would be really cool to just sort of have you speak, um, some words of wisdom, a little bit about your love of the word um to yeah. to our community so we've got some questions Please. for you yes <laughs> deal yeah man yeah i'm happy 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 to share great all right kick it off josh okay so my first question for you is skate ministry huh that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's how i worded it um we'd, we'd love to just hear a little bit more about how you became involved um it was skate church i believe and just how you got involved and how that impacted you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, let's see. So I grew up in, here in Portland, Oregon. That's where I live now. I got my first skateboard when I was 11. My parents gave me a skateboard and um, a subscription to Thrasher magazine when I was 11. They had no <laughs> idea what they were doing, what they were giving their 11-year-old son, Thrasher magazine. And so... Um, I, I don't know. I, I just got hooked. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, and so uh, I was immersed, uh, not just in skateboarding as a sport, but I just, what I loved was the culture. And I, I didn't like team sports or any of that kind of stuff. And so it really became a whole immersion uh, type of experience. And so um, I loved it. I, I think skateboard culture in Portland is different than California culture. Because Portland, it's a little, you know, it's more wet and cold throughout the, a lot of the year. So it drives a lot of skateboard culture inside or underground, especially parking garages. And there weren't that many parks when I was growing up. And so skateboard culture tended to be really interconnected with the music scene. And um, either in, in the 90s, it was either hip hop or garage punk, kind of both of those together. Yeah. So anyway, I just grew up in, in all of that, in like graffiti and punk rock and going to garage shows with my buddies and breaking into like parking garages so you can have a dry place to skateboard. And anyway, I loved it. It was the cool, it was amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> however, it also um, introduced me to a lot of the really self-destructive layers yeah. of portland urban culture and so pretty young you know i had i had in my teens you know i had friends who were having to go to rehab for heroin addictions and this kind of thing and and i don't i it's just god's grace i don't know what to say that i didn't end up making one of those catastrophic choices as a teenager i sure came close to getting put in jail a number of times but i didn't and so um 
in in all of that, um, my parents were followers of Jesus, and uh, but it, I didn't want anything to do with what they thought was cool because I already knew what was cool. Yeah. It was, yeah, <laughs> I was I was in it, you know, and uh, yeah, I was a teenage so, skateboarder. I knew what was cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, when I go when I think back now, it's literally it was the only thing that was valuable. There was no other mm-hmm. reference of anything that's important or valuable yeah. except skateboarding and my crew and this thing. There was uh, an indoor skate park uh, in Northeast Portland that was run by church, uh, and that's Skate Church Ministry. And so that um, that started in 1987. I, I think the first night I went, they were open in the evenings, and um, they would have everybody skate at the park, and then they would turn off all the lights, and someone would um, give a Jesus talk to everybody. Uh, for like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then to skate the second half of the night in the park, you had to sit through the talk. That was kind of like the deal. You sign a little thing when you come in, but you'll sit through the talk. (laughs) Um, I I started going and I would go with my friends. We'd sit in the back and make fun of the person giving the talk and stuff like that. (laughs) But uh, so years, I mean, this is like years of Tuesday nights. And, um, but uh, something happened over the long term. Those just the stories. It would just be a story of Jesus, story about Jesus, one of his teachings, and it's like they had this cumulative effect over the years. And uh, as I watched more and more of my friends just sink their lives, um, and it was a tight. I had a tight crew, but I could tell that even though we cared about each other, that it wasn't like it was contingent. You know, <laughs> there were conditions. And um, I watched a lot of what just what human nature, you know, mm-hmm. betrayal and people sure. ruin their lives. And all of a sudden, the the guys who ran the skate park and who Jesus was just became really attractive to me. And so even though I've ended up having a career in like Bible and history and Bible nerdiness, um, <laughs> for me, the, the draw was always and still uh, remains uh, just the person of Jesus and yeah. the effect that he has on people who really take seriously what he was doing and saying and mm. and what he is still doing and saying. And so it was Jesus first. That's what got me into the whole thing. And so I, I decided to start following Jesus uh, one summer, summer of 1995. And uh, there was one of the guys who really invested in a friendship with me. And um, it was just awesome. It, and so it was like in the span of one summer, just the whole trajectory of my life shifted. I almost failed out of high school and I had no plans to go to college. I was working at the lowest rung UPS job, like um, loading trucks with boxes that spill in off the conveyor belt. <laughs> but I did it because you could just work from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then I could just go skate every day. It was perfect. It was just like all of a sudden um, I was around these people who cared not just about Jesus, but they actually like would read the Bible and then like talk about its meaning and like what they're going to do in response to it. That was like what they would do for a good time. (laughs) (laughs) Who are these people? (laughs) What is this? Because of their commitment to Jesus, I had never witnessed anything like it. And so that group of friends became... Um, a whole new way of being human to me. I, I ended up signing up to go to college because a whole bunch of these other guys, skateboarders who became Christians around the same time I did, we all started uh, taking classes together at a Bible college that was across the street from the skate park. That's why we went there. Yeah, that ministry, you know, it was about people. It was about just the simple message about the good news about Jesus and loving your neighbors yourself. I don't know, man. It was life changing. I'm forever grateful for Skate Church and met me right where I was at. It was really amazing. So you were a, you were a skate rat, and 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 now you're a biblical studies guy. Wow. Yeah. That? <laughs> yeah, that's totally. That? It's not a I very mean, normal like what, career arc. <laughs> no, that's not the, yeah. that's not the typical. Uh, when you go to the high yeah. school counselor, she's not like, listen, you're going to start your career in skating and then you're going to move towards biblical studies. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah totally. So how, yeah. how did that happen? What is, what is literally just going to these little 
Bible studies? Like what made you fall in love with the word? What, how, how, how yeah. did that happen? Yeah. Well, uh, there were, yeah, there were two layers. One was the guy who started Skate Church in Portland. Uh, his name is Paul Anderson. And he, um, he loves Jesus. He's dedicated his whole life. I mean, Skate Church has been going now for over 30 years and he's still doing it. And um, he's got a good team around him, but he's still going for it. And he also just really loves the scriptures. Like he just, um, I, I would hang out around the skate park um, or I would get off work and go help build ramps or something like that to get ready for that night of skate church. And I'd hang out with Paul. And so we would build ramps for an afternoon and he would always be playing a new American standard translation, like audio, like a CD <laughs> uh, of the Bible. He would just be listening to the Bible. And so, you know, we would like build a mini ramp and we'd have listened to the whole Pentateuch like within a week or something like that, you know? And that was just kind of how he rolled. He was just like that. And uh, his Bible was super just shredded. He read it so much. So he was my first example of like what it means to be a Christian, which is love your neighbor, you know? Um, he was a young dad at the time. Read your Bible and like try and understand it because it'll help you follow Jesus. It was that simple. So I didn't know. I was like, I get this is Christianity. I get this is what you do. So that was really the first layer of it was just um, I wanted to follow Jesus and I would read the stories about him. But half of the things that Jesus would say or do, I didn't understand half the time. And uh, or he would be quoting and referencing the, all of the earlier parts of this book that we call Christians call the Old Testament. And so just reading the Bible got me into reading the Bible. And I thought it was cool because Paul Anderson thought it was cool. And that was the first step. <laughs> um, second step was this kind of crew of a number of us who became Christians around the same time signed up for classes uh, at the Bible college across the street. B because I, I was trying to read the Bible and I enjoyed it sometimes. I was confused most of the other times and even like disturbed. Uh, some other times, uh, the violence and the sex scandals and so on um, in the Bible that are committed by like the people who you think are the heroes or the good people or something. I, yeah, I was intrigued and it was really, it was at Multnomah Bible College that um, I sat in classes with uh, two, two teachers, professors in particular, who just <clears throat> captured my imagination. Um, and in biblical studies, but also in uh, history and culture. I, and I, I don't know what else to say. I, I had smoked a lot of pot in my teen years. And I was had like a, a year or so, I think, of just my brain, whew, like coming out of the fog. And in my early 20s, I it was like started following Jesus. And I feel like my brain actually started working at full capacity for the first time yeah. in a long, long time. And uh, so all of a sudden, like I was just, the whole world opened up to me. Everything was fascinating to me. Um, science, yeah. you know, just biology 101. I couldn't believe it. But then biblical studies really yeah. captured my imagination. There's one professor who introduced biblical literature as art, as really um, mm. um, sophisticated, nuanced literary art. And um, I appreciated that because in this odd way, somehow skateboard culture just immersed me in visual art yeah. culture all through my teens. And so all of a sudden I was recognizing and having these experiences of real beauty and transcendence, mm -hmm. but not visually, mm -hmm. but through the literary artistry of the Bible. And I just thought it was the coolest thing That's in the cool. world, except it was a different kind of literary art. It was ancient Israelite literary art, yeah. you know? <laughs> Um, and so I, I don't know what to say other than it just, it sparked my imagination and I just became fascinated with biblical literature because it helped me understand Jesus in ways that I never would have otherwise. And it also opened me to just a bigger vision of the world and human history. And mm. uh, so there, there you go. Th those were kind of the two moments, Paul Anderson, and then these two, uh, professors at, uh, at Multnomah. Yeah. I think it's really cool for me to hear just kind of how it keeps coming back to like this background in skate culture of like it immersed you in this kind of a 
artistic culture and then you st- mm-hmm. you're finding that in your study of the bible too which is very mm. um i don't know that's really cool mm. one of the things you know we i guess i'd i'd like to ask is that you know our leaders they love the bible too they love to read the bible mm. But some of them often express to us, man, I just feel like unqualified to teach the Bible or I feel like just to lead a Bible study, even like I just feel like I don't know enough or I'm not good enough or I don't know where to start. Yeah. And where do you where the heck do you start? And so, um, yeah, what kind of advice would you have for those leaders who who are struggling, who feel like, man, I just don't know enough. I don't know where to start. The book is so complicated, you know. What what kind of advice would you give to our leaders? Yeah, well, um, I totally get that. Uh, yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I get that. And it's actually that same feeling um, that has been driving me all, all of these years. Um, Paul, you know, all those years ago, asked me to just tell my story. It's the first talk I ever gave at Skate Church. I was giving the Jesus talk eventually. Like, I, <laughs> so it's a weird, ironic twist. And so... Uh, after uh, I gave, just told my story, my experience a couple times, I realized I didn't really have anything else to say. <laughs> so, and so Paul was like, well, here, like, here, here's a story about Jesus. Like, talk about that. And I was, but I was like, what, say, what do I say after you're done reading it? Like, so I, I get it. Like, I was exactly in that position. And uh, it, I cut my teeth uh leading the junior high bible study at skate church a bunch of little squirrely skate rats um and uh and so i i really felt insecure and didn't know what i was talking about but what i tried to do was let that feeling be a motivator to learn yeah um mm. and and which isn't saying that uh you know, most people need to go to graduate school in biblical yeah, studies. Yeah. I actually really, really don't recommend that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I do think that every part of following Jesus means understanding the story which he saw himself bringing to its fulfillment. And mm-hmm. so that will mean understanding these texts that Jesus cared so deeply about. That's why he quoted yeah. from them and talked about them all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so another question that's kind of related to this, and maybe this question should have come before that one, but um, like skate culture, ski snowboard culture can be pretty tough, pretty anti-authority, pretty dark, transient, transient yeah. laid back, apathetic. Mm-hmm. It can be a difficult yeah. culture to minister yeah. in. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess my question yeah. would be, how do we emphasize the importance of studying the Bible in this mm. kind of a culture? I get. I guess I might frame that a little differently. Um, if I was, you know, I was doing. If I was in charge of something like skate church or doing something like you guys were doing, I wouldn't. And I'm not saying you guys do this, but it's just how you, how you ask the question. I wouldn't frame it in terms of getting people interested in the Bible. Um, what you want people to do is to be captivated by the the person of Jesus, um, and uh, the fact that it was just the stories about Jesus and the teaching, his teachings for years that just sat with me as I sat at the back of the room with my buddies, making fun of the guy giving the talk at skate church. But it was that stuff worked on me. And all of a sudden I became to be like, all right, the version that I saw, like of how my parents do Christianity. And I thought it was just stupid because you know, they gave me Thrasher magazine and that was telling me the truth about the world. Right. <laughs> And um, so, but, but just the person of Jesus, how he treated people, how he talked about himself and others, um, about our relationship to God, it was captivating. It's captivating stuff, man. Yeah. What, whatever yeah, you want to. I think the question, go ahead. it's not just convincing people, it's, but it's like, how do we emphasize the importance of that is like, yeah. Well, just be inspired by it yourself, you know, yeah. and let that had been affected by that was what really affected you. Is It's like the mm. experience of seeing and meeting a person who has had that experience and has been dramatically changed yeah. by that story. And and yeah. you got that consistently. You got that mm-hmm. week in and week out. You, you heard from these guys who you looked up to and who had been affected 
by Jesus, yeah. by the real Jesus. And it's like, that's yeah. sometimes it's not even like, it's not just convincing people. It's, but it's like, how do we emphasize the importance of that is like, yeah, well, just yep. be inspired by it yourself, you know, <laughs> and let yeah. that totally. be consistent in your community with people like don't yeah. hide. That totally. Been, yeah. Cause yeah, I'm, yeah. I think in my, my experience of skate church, it was really these people that, um, were really genuine people of integrity. They were actually, most of the guys who ran the park were also really good skateboarders. So that helped. <laughs> but, uh, but then it was also, um, they really cared about each other and they began to care about me. Um, and then I, it was, Jesus was at the center of this whole thing. And they also read the Bible and talked about it a lot. It was like this whole package deal. And, uh, and then all of a sudden I just found myself, well, caring about trying to read the Bible and understand it. And it wasn't just the Bible in isolation. It was the whole, it was the whole thing. It w- and that's how, that's how the Bible came into existence in the first place was through a group of people through whom God was working to tell his story to the world. And these texts became both a product and the fuel of the people movement. Um, and so, uh, uh, People don't encounter the Bible in a vacuum. They encounter it within a community that embodies the story and presence of Jesus. So I, I think that's how the Bible becomes compelling, is when it's one element of a healthy community of Jesus' followers just doing its thing in whatever cultural context you know they happen to find themselves. For sure. Yeah. Okay, yep. that's great. Thanks. <laughs> totally. And can we ask you one last question? Yeah, yeah. Do you have sure. time for one more? Totally. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we find ourselves in a weird little culture, you know, we're, we're in this bizarre subculture. That's this seasonal <laughs> thing. Hmm. Lots of these people, they travel all over the world chasing winter. Yes. yes. Um, and there's these weird transient communities. Their resorts are like these mega glitzy things, but they're run on like the backs of these like seasonal employees who have <laughs> nothing. And so we're like ministering in this really weird, yep. pretty bizarre subculture. And, um, Hmm. it's hmm. like a, hmm. we, I, you know, like my mission missions background makes me think, man, this is like a tribal thing. Like there's this tribal hmm. style ministry. Like we're ministering hmm. in pretty specific verbiage. We wear the clothes. We, you know, we like, we do things like this as a tribe of people. And yeah, yeah. there are other ministries like this, Christian caters, you know, Christian so servers. Is. Like there, there are people who are, who are seeing subculture in this tribal regard and going, these are my people. I want to take the gospel to my people in mm-hmm. our context. Um, do you, uh, do you have much experience with that? Would you, I guess the question is like, would you encourage our leaders to keep doing this kind of this style of bringing the word of God, mm-hmm. bringing the spirit of mm-hmm. God into this like tribe, your tribal context? Uh, yes. Totally. <laughs> I tell you, I mean, I, it's, I think it's the, the lifeblood of the Jesus movement from the first, from the first uh, decades. You know, it began as a messianic Jewish movement in Jerusalem. And then uh, you had the, whatever happened at Pentecost, it blew people's categories. Uh, and then you had, you know, um, uh, Stephen... Or some other guys going, yeah, like, well, there's there's Samaritans over there. And talk about an insular. There, it's an insular subculture today, the tribe of the Samaritans. And it certainly was in the first century. And But they went over the hills and, like, started telling the story of Jesus there. So I, the lifeblood of the thing, the language that the scriptures are even written in changed over time from Hebrew and Aramaic and then mainly into Greek because of these kind of tribal cultural reach. And differences and so um the story of jesus is the most universal story that has become the most multi-ethnic multi-tribal religious movement in human history uh, there's a reason for that because <laughs> um, it's such a translatable story and so um I, in my mind the lifeblood of the movement is about um being able to reach the story of jesus being translated into every subcultural language that exists 
Because at the core, it's just human nature is what's running all these subcultures anyway. It's the same stuff of just people wanting to know that they're loved and that they belong and that they have value and finding meaningful work to do. That's really what we all want. <laughs> mm. And uh, so, yes, well, I, yes, yes, yes. Um, so anyway, uh, yes, in, in every way. I, I, who knows? Yes. I have no idea what I would be doing if Paul Anderson hadn't started, you know, built a skate park in the back parking lot of a church um, because there was nothing else like that going on in Portland. And I, it, I thank God every day that he did because it set the course of my whole life and hundreds of other people, you know, I'm not the only one. Well, Hey, thanks. Thanks for taking the time to, uh, to hang out with us like this. This will be a huge blessing for our leaders. Just hearing, hearing from you and hearing from your experience and uh, um, yeah. Super yeah yeah totally yeah thanks i can't thank you now thanks yeah totally thank you for the invitation and um yeah keep keep doing what you're doing 